In today's reading of Unwind Your Mind Back to God, written by David Hofmeister and read by Tarana Singh, we continue laying the foundation in Book 1. This is Chapter 4, Section 5. A Discussion About Needs David, in this discussion I would like to get into some of the metaphysics of the course and how the mind works without being too abstract and theoretical. The deceived mind believes so much in the specifics of this world that we have to start with the specifics and work our way back from the bottom up. We begin with the way we perceive things initially. Our presenting problem or situation. And then we will work it back to the mind. We will trace it to the beliefs and what is going on in the mind. Because that is really where our release is. We want to hold the intention to get very clear about the ego. To be able to see the ego for what it is. And to remain above the battlefield. First you get to notice where your attachments are. There is much to be grateful for with this. Because... You cannot begin to let go of something until you can see it. Whenever questions come up in your mind, if you have a question for me, just feel free to express it. There are not any good questions or bad questions. Is there anybody who has any questions now? Friend, About money, (laughs) I have been trying to get straight in my mind about applying the course and then having things manifest a certain way. Explain it to me. David, that whole question of manifesting? Friend, Well, I just keep reading how you can make these corrections and then you suffer no consequences. That part, and somehow it links up into being at peace and... David, it is true that the Course just comes straight out and says that it has one goal and that peace of mind, that is peace of mind, or the peace of God. Often people wonder what the Course says about abundance or manifesting, etc. Basically, the first thing that needs to be worked on with the Course is the realization that everyone that comes to this world in some sense perceives themselves as very tiny weak and frail. You can deal with that in certain ways. Some people try to overcompensate with money or possessions or with particular relationships. But your worth is established by God. Nothing you think or say or do is needed to establish your worth. Yet the mind believes it is a very small person in a body and it has to constantly strive and struggle to keep its head above water, whether it is financially or health-wise or in any number of ways. There are a lot of metaphysical systems that talk about the idea of manifesting. If you really focus on visualizing or holding a certain thing in mind, it will come to you. 
I would see that as a stepping stone. The highest aim of prayer is for the atonement, for peace of mind. A stepping stone along the way may be that you discover that you do seem to be able to manifest certain things, helping you to see that your mind is powerful. But once experience shows you how powerful your mind is, then you have to ask what you really want the goal to be. Why not have the atonement or peace of mind be your goal? Now, about money. There can be a fear of not having enough. For me, it was about letting go of my worldly pursuits, letting go of trying to achieve and also to not judge outcomes. It requires trust to follow this in and see that everything is working out. The Holy Spirit is the safety net but sometimes it feels like we are walking on a tight rope. We hear the Holy Spirit is in there but it is usually not until we seem to teeter or fall off and land on the net that we realize it has always been there for us. It comes down to what is it for? Content is purpose in our mind. Content is the question of purpose. What is it for? That is a very alien question to the ego. The ego is bent on form outcomes, on setting specific external goals and then striving to achieve them. When you do, you feel like, gee, I still am not happy. What is next? The game of I will be happy when goes on and on. That peace is a decision, is a powerful idea. That peace is a decision, is a powerful idea. In a way, that is where the course veers away from many of these psychotherapies and practices of going into your past to get in touch with sub unconscious memories and scenes that are believed to be the cause of the problem. There is nothing in your past that is causing the problem. This is radical considering so many psychotherapies say you must delve into your past. Your peace of mind as well as guilt, fear and anger is based on a present decision. A decision you are making this very instant. Instead of going on a witch hunt into your past, the focus is on a present decision. Now, if we follow that in a little further, a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. So my peace of mind or my state of mind is dependent on a present decision. And the decision is a conclusion based on everything that I believe. 
It is important to get in touch with the unconscious beliefs in our mind without raising them to the light, to look right at them and see what they are. Assumptions will just continue to lurk under the surface. Then it is more like being a robot. Getting up in the morning, brushing your teeth, getting ready for work, you go through the motions. How many of us get up in the morning, sit up in bed and ask, what is the nature of reality? I do not even want to brush my teeth until I get a handle on this. It is like you click into gear and then maybe during your lunch hour or sometime at work, you will have some of those questions come in. Sometimes they come in the form of What am I doing here? What is the purpose of any of this? Often these questions will get brushed aside by all the things you think you have to do. It is like all the practical things get in the way of starting to investigate these questions. The ego would have us keep those questions out of mind because the more we start to go into the mind, the more we begin to question the beliefs that this world is built upon. When we talk about the idea of decision, we also get into the whole idea of choice. When I was growing up, I always had a sense of destiny. But I really did not like the idea of predetermination. The idea of destiny and predetermination seemed to eliminate my choice. In psychology, I studied behaviorism, which claims that everything is predetermined by your environment. Stimulus response. You just keep reacting to your environment. I did not like that idea much because it means I am just a victim or I am just completely determined by my circumstances. I liked the idea of choice, but then I would hear about psychics and people who would literally read the future or read the past. It was like they were reading from a script or something. How could these psychics be predicting things that would happen? How could they read the future and see a destiny? How do you put the two together? How do you put free will or choice together with destiny? The course brought it all together for me. The script is written. During the holy instant, all the scripts and all the perceptions were spun out in one instant and the Holy Spirit was given as a simultaneous answer. All the happenings took place in one specific instant. Where does choice come in then? Your only choice is about how you are going to look at what is on the screen. You always have the choice of whether you are going to look through the ego's lens or the Holy Spirit's lens. Within the dream framework, that is the only choice we have. That is not 
the way it seems because it seems as if we are persons in this vast world and it does not seem at the beginning like we are dreaming a dream it seems like we are figures in the dream that we go through every day and it seems like we have choices as persons in other words we can choose what to wear in the morning what to eat where to go and those kinds of things in this world that is what choice stands for the ego counsels for example that the more money you have the more choice the more freedom you have right a course in miracles says the only choice you have in every instant is how you look upon what is happening that is where the freedom lies the freedom does not lie in choosing between the illusions so to speak choosing between a blue shirt and a green shirt do not arrest your mind in choosing between illusions you can have a big dilemma do i want to read the course tonight or do i want to watch this tv show basically what it comes down to is the real question of what purpose will i bring to reading the course what purpose will i bring to watching the tv show what is this for what is the purpose the only way you can wake up to the eternal reality of your true identity as christ the son of god is to see the choice where it is you have to see the problem where it is in the deceived state problems seem to be on the screen in the world the problem is not having the rent money or being cut off on the highway or having a hangnail or cancer or a mother-in-law who won't speak to you if you perceive the problem to be on the screen or in the world you are stuck because there is no solution to the external problems we seem to come up with solutions we seem to come up with enough rent etc for example polio seemed to be a big problem and then we seemed to come up with a polio vaccination ah a solution it is more like having a dam break and just pushing a bunch of little things in there to plug the hole the reason why it is important to see the decision the choice and the problem where it is is because it can never be solved out there in the world the ego counsels address the issue of scarcity by getting a job that pays lots of money as if that will take care of your problem with scarcity that is the obvious way of dealing with the problem but scarcity is a belief in your mind and the only way you will ever completely heal it is by bringing the belief in scarcity to the holy spirit when the belief will be gone and you will not have the problem anymore friend 
That is what I want to know about. I want to know about the belief in scarcity being gone. Then I will not have the problem because I will have money. <laughs> David, no, the perception will change. Friend, I'm just slow. I'm sorry. David, it is good. We can use the issue of money because the issue with money or the issue with anything else is basically the same thing. Friend, I know it is not out there, but I cannot figure out how to fix it in here. I mean, I need a house to live in. I think I know that, don't I? David, in one of the very, very earliest sections in the course, The Illusion of Needs, Jesus says that the idea of the order of needs arose because there was a fundamental error being made. The fundamental error is the lack, is the belief in lack. The belief I am lacking or not complete or whole. Having made this fundamental error, you had already fragmented yourself into levels with different needs. As you integrate, you become one and your needs become one accordingly. Unified needs lead to unified action because this produces a lack of conflict. The idea of orders of need which follows from the original error that one can be separated from God requires correction at its own level before the error of perceiving levels at all can be corrected. Text Chapter 1 Section 6 Let's bring it back to the practical. When we think about the world, when we think of ourselves as persons in the world, it seems that we have needs on different levels. We can talk about the mental level, We can talk about the emotional level. Is anyone familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs where he talks about the basic levels of needs? Food, clothing, warmth, sex, etc. He also talked about self-actualization needs of reaching your full potential. To be more specific, What if we went around the room and talked about things that we are really interested in and believe in? Some people might talk about environmental issues. Others may talk about eradicating AIDS. Other people may have interpersonal problems on their minds, problems with their husband or daughter, Or it may be financial needs, chronic conditions, sickness or disease. There are so many different topics. It seems like saving the dolphins, cancer and the interpersonal relationship with your mother are really different things. This is the illusion of levels of needs. Workbook Lessons 79 and 80 teach Let me recognize the problem so it can be solved. And then 
Let me recognize my problems have been solved. If you read point blank, let me recognize that my problems have been solved. It is like, wait a minute, I do not feel that way. It seems like every day you have to deal with problems, interpersonal problems, survival, and so on and so forth. But you only have one problem, and there is one solution to that problem. Isn't that nice to think it is so simple? If there is such a thing as truth, it will be simple. One problem and one solution. If I perceive the problem to be in the world, it cannot be solved because the Holy Spirit is the one answer to that one problem. And the Holy Spirit is in the mind. God did not place the answer where the problem was not. He did not place the answer out on the screen. He did not place the answer in the world. He placed the answer in the mind of the sleeping sun. And that is where the Holy Spirit is. The Course constantly reminds you to bring illusions to the truth. Bring your false beliefs to the light. To the Holy Spirit in your mind. The false ideas and the false beliefs that are in the mind are all backwards. They all have the basic error that there is something on the screen that is causative and your mind is the effect. For example, you mentioned preferring an 80 degree day over a 60 degree day. The mind has beliefs in preferences of temperature. Some like it hot, some like it cold. It seems like there is something on the screen, the sun, that makes you feel hot. If you do not put enough food in this body, then that is what makes you hungry. You do not see that the hunger has something to do with the belief in your mind that you have separated from God. You believe you are hungry because you do not have enough food. It is kind of like when you were a kid and got into fights with your little sister or with a neighborhood child, you would run to mom and tell her, that so and so made you mad or hurt your feelings. Or maybe your boss told you off today which just made you fume and lose your peace of mind. The world and the ego teach that there is always something on the screen that is the cause of your upset. And not only that, there is always something on the screen that is the cause of your happiness like that giant hot fudge sundae. I'm happy tonight because I get to eat my hot fudge sundae. Oh, I got the woman I was chasing all my life. She finally fell in love with me, so now I'm happy and we go into the sunset. No matter what it is, I have the right job, I got the right promotion, I have the right car, and I am living in the right area. No, no. Our peace of mind and our upset has nothing at all to do with what is happening on the screen. 
but it has everything to do with our interpretation of what is happening on the screen. You are always reading into things all the meanings that you are feeling. All the feelings you have watching a movie, for example, are coming from within you. You never react to what happens directly. You always react to your interpretation of what is happening. What you need to work with is correcting your interpretations and perceptions. How many of us have tried to correct things in a behavioral sense? I am too fat. I will go on a diet. I do not have enough money. I will go get a better job. I have a certain kind of illness, so I will go to a specialist that does an operation or that gives me a particular kind of medicine. Or behavior modification. I want to be a good Christian like Jesus and be kind, so I'm going to try to be a kind person. Meanwhile, inside there is anger or rage, but we are trying to put on a nice mask because we think we want to do the kind thing. Forget about your behavior. Behavior will follow automatically from your thoughts and perceptions. Do not try to fix things out there with your behavior, but follow me inward with this. Look at perception and raise up the false beliefs then you will have a transformation of your mind. Behavior will follow automatically. Doesn't that make sense? Intuitively, you can see where this is going. Friend, I can see how it makes sense, but I think what is confusing sometimes is when we are taught that what is in our world is a reflection of what is in the mind. I think, okay, well, let's go to the source here, and if this has changed, if I become one with God, then this will automatically follow. It is unrealistic to think that we will suddenly become millionaires, but if you come to the consciousness and really realize you are not lacking or you are not sick, would there not be some kind of change in the outward world to reflect the change in mind? David, the error is that the deceived mind really believes that there is an objective world out there, a world that is apart from you and me. But all perception is completely subjective. Every time any fragment looks through the ego's lens, he sees the world in a distorted way. Friend, so the shift is to see there never was a lack in the first place and we never really were sick in the first place. David, there is the clarity of seeing this choice where it is, of seeing that it was just a misperception. Friend, I notice sometimes that if I am faced with a big bear in the middle of the road of this dream I am in, what has been helpful is to recognize that my goal for the day is the peace of God, just for today. Sometimes that is all I can do. David, that simplifies things. It really brings it home. The important thing is to stay with the peace 
and to be open to the Holy Spirit's guidance. The Holy Spirit does not work in the world. He is in the mind. That may be very scary, but the Holy Spirit will reach you wherever you believe you are. If you believe you are a mother and you believe you have three kids and you only have five dollars left, then, when you really set aside the chatter and focus on peace as the goal, you may receive specific guidance on steps to take. In this case, it is not really helpful to just sit there and think about how God is abstract and does not know about this world. Focus on the peace and there, then be open to who to call or what to do next. That makes it very practical. And do not look for outcomes, even in the slightest way. Judging or gauging how well you are doing by the outcome is a trap. Many people fall into this trap with sickness. We talk about sickness being a decision and that our state of mind is completely our own responsibility. There is nothing outside of us and there is no blaming God and no blaming the medical model or blaming the doctors. People will take that idea and put that together with a diagnosis of cancer or flu and start to think, I should be able to do better than this. This is still identity confusion. To say that I am responsible and then to put that with, oh, I have cancer is to try to combine two different levels. Remember, we are responsible for the way we look at things. When you bring it down to, and I have cancer, there is an I confusion there. If you look at the idea that sickness is a projection of guilt onto the body, Oh my gosh, what am I doing to myself? That is level confusion. Is Christ projecting sickness on himself? With my body, there is a very strong identification in the mind with this is me. The Course is gently guiding us away from this body identification to a point of seeing that we are mind. We can get clear on what the ego is and pull our mind from it. In other words, take the juice away from it. Take the power away. Then we will choose peace at that point. But as long as we think that the ego offers us something and we still buy into that, our minds are not willing to choose the peace. We want to make exceptions. We want to say that there is order of difficulties in miracles. This one right here is more difficult than that one. We want to hold on to exceptions. Every thought you have makes up some segment of the world you see. It is with your thoughts, then, that we must work if your perception of the world is to be changed. If the cause of the world you see is attack thoughts, you must learn that it is these thoughts which you do not want. 
Workbook Lesson 23 Attack thoughts would be analogous to the backward thoughts we were talking about. The ego-based thought that the cause is outside my mind. There is no point in lamenting the world. There is no point in trying to change the world. It is incapable of change because it is merely an effect. Workbook Lesson 23 Those are some very strong statements. It is like the analogy of the movie screen. You have a projector and some film with dark images moving through it. When the light shines through the dark images, shadows dance on the screen. Have you ever gone to one of those movies where there is a glitch in the film? When we try to change things in the world or look to the world for things for change, it is like going up and banging on the screen instead of going back to the manager in the projection room. We can see that it would be silly to do that. Literally, it is like the film that is going through the projector. Once you are able to overlook those dark thoughts, the world lights up, so to speak. The Course even talks about light episodes and gives some metaphors for that. When we let go of attack thoughts, our perception will literally light up. Now, that does not tell you anything about what is going on out there. In other words, when Jesus accepted the atonement, it did not seem that the world exactly changed a whole lot. The Jews continued to fight the Roman Empire. The world seemed to still be kind of a mess. But Jesus is saying that is just twisted perception. When you see war and conflict and fighting, it is the ego's lens that you are looking through. That is what is twisted. It is not about anything out there in and of itself. Friend, I think that no matter what, the world is going to be screwed up. Like with a film, if you do not like a certain scene, you can fast forward through it. But then after a while, another scene you do not like will come up. If it is not one thing, it is another. You can even make this world a pleasant place to live in to a certain extent. But in the final analysis, you are going to have to look at all those problems and say, Who cares? That is the way Jesus did it. He said, In this world, you need not have tribulation because I have overcome the world. That is why you should be of good cheer. Text chapter 4, section 1. You have to rise above it and not even see the problems as problems. David, yes, it is a real healing to be able to rise above them like that. Friend, that is what I meant, that it is not so much to heal the world, but to heal yourself. And once you heal yourself, the problems in the world do not matter anymore because you will not even see them. David That is what got me going initially. I talked earlier about not being able to reconcile what I was seeing with these eyes, with God. I had a feeling that God was all-knowing and all-loving and all-powerful. That all seemed to resonate but then I have these eyes and ears like watching the nightly news. When you say, I do not care, that is the good news. 
the world as you perceive it through the distorted lens is not reconcilable with God. There is no use trying to fit them together. Philosophy and science have tried. All kinds of efforts have been made to reconcile how this happened. God did not create sickness. God did not create war. God did not create these things. But when you are looking through a twisted lens, you see it outside yourself. Healing is about seeing that the split is in your own mind. Then you can see that the correction is also in your mind. I like to use the analogy of overhead projectors. There is this beautiful pure white light on the screen and then all the overlays are brought in. You can imagine drawing a body on it. Now there is an overlay with the body. Now we have form. Then the ego names this body as male or female and puts some skin color on it, some black, some white. Then we put age in there. And there we have all the problems, ageism, sexism, racism. It seems as if those are big problems in the world. You hear about them on the news. But the Course basically says that ageism is in your mind. Sexism is in your mind. Racism is in your mind. The ego belief system is in your mind. The problem of inequality is not in the world. It is in the split mind. You can see that it is really an unlearning or a subtraction process. It is not like you need to attend X number of seminars or read X number of books and then someday in the future, if you are lucky, you will finally arrive. It is really more of a subtraction thing. <laughs> you are it right now. But these other things are laid on. That is why it is so valuable to look together at all the constructs in our minds that we believe we are. They are just beliefs. There are many mind training exercises and guided meditations in the course that are designed to help you sink down beneath the thoughts and beliefs. It is important to realize that this is a course in transforming your mind. It is not a course in just memorizing text and talking about it. Sinking down beneath the thoughts is very, very important. The rest of the book helps you start to become aware of the backward thoughts and some of the concepts and ideas that you have. But really, it comes down to a constant job of what I call mind watching. <laughs>